Okay, so welcome back. We are going to look at uh, the third chapter of uh, Lewis's work, The Abolition of Man Now, and it, the third chapter is actually also the title of the book. And this is what he's been talking about all along and building up to, to some degree. In the first chapter, he called it Men Without Chess, and he was talking about how the education system uh, no longer provides what used to be seen as the chief function of the education uh, system, which was to train people's uh, chests to uh, develop character, to feel uh, uh, injustice keenly and to seek to uh, not to tolerate it, to be courageous in the face of uh, bullies and, and to defend the powerless and so forth. This was considered to be good training and it used to be exemplified by teachers. Modern education no longer does that he says, and it creates what he calls men without chests. And so he, con and he concluded with that illustration of we bid the geldings to be fruitful and multiply after we've made it impossible for them to do so because they don't have the character to do so. That you, we want them to live uh, moral lives, fruitful lives, lives that will be beneficial to themselves and others, but we haven't given the means to them the means to do it anymore. So it's, an, it's actually the educator's fault. And the reason he writes it is not to indict his, uh, these two school teachers, it's to bring about a change, right? And you can't change it if you're not willing to identify it. And so I think he puts his finger on it. I think he does it rather well. Um, and, um, but he's building up, in the, as I say, in the second section, which is just called the way, or as he calls it, the Tao, uh, he will identify how the very thing, the, the chest, which he says is missing in modern education, is there in every major religion. He, he, he gives exhaustive examples of precisely that, how they are speaking to the same thing. So you can't accuse him of being, this is a Christian argument, or he says, this is a human argument. This is what humanity as a collective has identified and recognized. And to fail to do so, is to create something different than a human being. So what are we then? And that then leads to this third chapter, which he calls the abolition of man. And now we get into uh, the modern state of affairs, which I said is even more, thank you, even more uh, pronounced than in the days in which he wrote it, because this is 1943. Technology's advanced a little bit since then. I, I want to go through a few of the uh, op opening statements in this great chapter because I think it's in some ways the best chapter of the three uh, and the most relevant and then I will talk about contemporary developments and we can reflect on that a little bit further but he says man's conquest of nature is an expression often used to describe the progress of applied science we've conquered the natural world And he says, um, so a man who's dying of cancer says to him, or tuberculosis, says, no matter, I know I'm one of the casualties. Of course, there are casualties on the winning as well as on the losing side. But that doesn't alter the fact that it is winning. In other words, progress is still happening. The world is getting better. We are overcoming these things. And there's the sense of the collective, the solidarity of humanity, the we. Things are getting better. And what is being overcome is nature and the infirmities of nature, disease, famine, those things are, we now have the technological means of overcoming. That's a common statement. Uh, you will hear it from uh, so, uh, philosophers and scientists to this day, uh, ranging from Steven Pinker, who talks about the great benefits of modern education to uh, Jordan Peterson will say the same. And I don't think that they're entirely wrong. We live in a wealthier, uh, healthier world than ages previous. So there is something to the case that's being made. On the other hand, there's also the moral issue and the problem of the commodification of human nature, which Lewis is going to talk about now. And that problem we can see all the way back to the Enlightenment. If you remember back to your first year uh, uh, in the 18th century, many of you would have read Jonathan Swift's Modest Proposal. I know some of you did it with me, and I think it was done in other classes as well. He proposed to solve the Irish problem, too many Catholics having too many babies, 
and you know outbreeding the Protestants, and so we have a political problem on our borders. So and they're poor and they don't they can't look after them, and so they're begging and stealing. And how do we deal with these problems? And he makes the suggestion because the Ireland at that stage was under the rule of Protestant uh, aristocrats who were effectively not caring about the people who were poor in their midst because they were after all just Catholics. So there was a religious bias against them. And he proposed, Swift, the clergyman, the Anglican, proposed a modest solution, yeah. namely they eat their babies. And they sell their babies for food because then they would get, they wouldn't be poor anymore. And then we'd take care of the Catholic problem. And we'd also take care of the malnutrition problem. And what a great solution. Everybody benefits. He doesn't mean it seriously. It's, it's satire. It's a modest proposal. It's, a mod it's not modest at all. It's, a, it's an outrageous proposal. But, but his point in giving it that title is that what happens right now is outrageous, but it's accepted socially and nobody's saying anything. So he writes a satire to expose it. But what he's talking about is the commodification of human nature. People are now being treated like objects. They're like the natural world which has been conquered. People are regarded as things. Now that begins in the Enlightenment and it carries on into the 19th century. And in another work of Lewis's, a uh, lecture he gave actually, his inaugural lecture at Cambridge University, it's called De Descriptione Temporum on the Description of the Ages. He talks about how sometime in the middle of the 19th century, this idea of the conquest of nature, namely the world out there, shifted to humanity. And now it was human nature that was to be conquered. And there were new fields of study that were developed to do this. And what were those fields? Psychology, sociology, anthropology, the so-called social sciences. And these now took human nature and quantified everything, made everything a matter of statistical analysis, looked at people as if they were things that could be measured and weighed and, they're, uh, and observed and they're, they could be trained in terms of the way you would train a, a, a rat, conditioning training, classical conditioning. That was starting to happen in the human sciences, but this is a new phenomenon. This is mid 19th century. This is when uh, morality and uh, science have, pa have parted ways. It's the same time that the, the book Frankenstein was written, if you've read that. It's a, it's a gothic novel, it's a nightmare scenario when uh, a scientist creates a, this human being who's eight feet tall, made out of body parts, for the sake of progress, for the sake of the advancement of the human race. That's early 19th century. By our day, scientists are actually doing this, talking about this, talking about implanting parts, creating parts, putting brains into people, doing brain transplants and so forth. So if you read, and I understand Dr. Scott put on this course, that hideous strength, that's the main thing that happens in that novel is there is a, uh, a brain is being taken and put it into another human being and they associate the brain with the person because they're materialists. They don't understand that a person's brain is not the person's uh, soul. But that's another topic of discussion. But he says, we've got this wit. And he says, I've chosen this point, the story at my point of departure in order to make it clear that I do not wish to disparage all that is really beneficial in the process as man's conquest because I don't either. I'm thank you, thankful for vaccinations and for clean water and for refrigeration and for all sorts of technological advances. Um, Jordan Peterson observes that one of the great events of the 20th century is the discovery uh, for women of uh, menstrual like pads and so forth. Women can go out in public all the time. Sorry if it's a sensitive subject, but it, it actually is transformative. Just little, little things like that are really socially transformative. And those are good things. I, I think that's true myself. Um, but he says, in what sense is man the possessor of increasing power over nature? So he's, now he's going to interrogate this a little further. And he chooses three examples, the airplane, the wireless, the wireless being, let's say, a telephone, 
they, today we have wireless phones, <coughs> literally wireless phones. He's talking about something less advanced. And the contraceptive. These are all exhibiting power over nature. In civilized community, in peacetime, anyone who can pay for them may use these things. Anyone. You can have access to any of those three. But it cannot strictly be said that when he does so, he is exercising his own proper or individual power over nature as a whole. If I pay you to carry me, I am not therefore myself a strong man. Any or all of these three things I have mentioned can be withheld from some men by other men. By those who sell or those who allow the sale, those who own the sources of production or those who make the goods. And so his observation is this. What we call man's power is in reality a power possessed by some men which they may or may not allow other men to profit by. Again, as regards the powers manifested in the airplane or the wireless, man is as much the patient or the subject as the possessor, the sufferer of these things. It happens to us. We don't have power over it. It's, it's gaining power over us. Think about the phone. You got a cell phone in your pocket. It gives you great power to connect with other people. What else does it do? It means that they can reach you at all times. Uh, there are now neurological studies, psychi psychological studies that su suggest that having uh, these devices on you makes you nervous. You got to check your phone all the time. It, behave it, it conditions you. So you're suffering from what the thing is that empowers you at the same time. And that's because we are actually embodied beings and we are conditioned beings. So we're never just, uh, technology is not just a tool for us to use, it also changes us. So we're as much the patient or subject as the possessor, since man, here the whole human race is man, he is the target both for bombs and for propaganda. And as regards contraceptives, there is a paradoxical negative sense in which all possible future generations are the patients or subjects of a power wielded by those already alive. So we have power not only of our, over our own generation, but over future generations. You ever thought about that? Most people haven't. His point is the power over nature is the power that some men have to exhibit power over other people. So it's not really power over nature as it's presented quite so simply. By contraception simply, they are denied existence. By contraception used as a means of selective breeding, they are without their concurring voice made to be what one generation for its own reasons may choose to prefer. Now this is happening in Germany at the time and it's happening in England at the time and it's happening in Canada at the time in forced sterilization. Happens in Canada. You, it's called eugenics, the eugenics movement. It was happening in the United States. It was happening all over the Western world, in fact. And they did it for the sake of humanity to improve the human condition. What it was implying is that there are some people who are less human than others. Where does the definition of humanity fall? Who decides who's human and who's not human? Who's fit? to survive, who isn't fit. His summary here is from this point of view, what we call man's power over nature turns out to be a power exercised by some men over other men with nature as its instrument. It's the commodification of human nature. Now somebody has the power and somebody is suffering from that power. So it's not of common human benefit, it's a benefit to some people and not others. In fact, some people are denied existence altogether based on this. And therefore their, their humanity, I began with the Swift's modest proposal, the humanity of the Irish was being denied by the English aristocrats. Here we see that the humanity of some people by the Nazis is denied and they are, they are refused even existence. And if they do exist, we can also send them to the gas chambers and exterminate them and breed a master race, as it was called at the time. Now that was happening in Germany. It was happening here in Canada, out in Saskatchewan. Uh, the the uh, 
founder of, of Canadian Healthcare, Tommy Douglas, great hero of the NDP, uh, approved of, of eugenics, supported it. It was a common Christian position at the time, I will tell you. They were trying to diminish human suffering. We don't want people who are born with terrible diseases, defects, genetic defects, to come under the world and we will diminish suffering that way. They didn't acknowledge the humanity of those people as people. They were taking, exercising power over it. Some people to this day think it's a good thing. If you go to a hospital, ladies, and you're pregnant, they're going to do a scan. They're not doing it so you can see a little photo of your baby when they're 10 weeks old. They're looking for genetic defects. If they think it, that they've got one, they are going to strongly encourage you to get rid of the child. I'm just telling you right now. And by the way, the scans are not very accurate. I know people have refused to do the scans or even had them and still chose to have the baby. And when the baby comes out, the baby's perfectly fine. But rather than run the risk of a defective human being, they abort, which they think is therapeutic. It's helping. That's how it's presented. What's the difference between the unborn human being in the womb and the small human being once it comes out of the womb? I mean, what's the difference? Time? Size? I would think that it's in a safer place in the mother's womb. It's actually the most dangerous place in the whole world, in Canada at any rate. Most dangerous place to be is in a mom's womb. This is all done in the name of progress and choice. But note that it's a choice and a power over other people. And this is his point, the abolition of man. So that, beginning with that, this, and this famous phrase, what we call man's power over nature turns out to be a power exercised by some men or women, and as I say, he includes women under men here, over other men with nature as its instrument. We just appeal to nature. In order to understand fully what man's power over nature and therefore the power of some men over other men really means, we must picture the race extended in time from the date of its emergence to that of its extinction. Each generation exercises power over, over other ones. So what we do in our generation is not only for our generation. There's currently the environmental movement. They're making this very appeal. Like we're destroying the planet for future generations. That's the moral argument that's being made. I'm not, at, I'm not taking sides on it, but that is the, that's the moral appeal. It's not only we who will inherit this earth. There'll be a consequence to it. The same thing's being said about uh, about debt. Sure, we can borrow money and we can spend more money, but if the debt grows up, who's going to inherit the debt? It's the next generation. Exact same moral argument is made, right? It's a good argument, by the way. And they don't get to vote, right? They're going to get it whether they want it or not. Do you consider those in your actions? Well, you would. So if you're going to consider what the right thing to do, you're going to consider what the right thing is, not just now, but what will always be right in the future. Is it right to go into debt? Is it right to despoil the environment? You know, pour gasoline on your ground or pesticides in huge quantities. Is that right? Well, it takes care of the problem here. Yeah, but you've just poisoned the ground for you know, let's say you used radiation, you know, the ground's radioactive now and it's going to be radioactive a few decades from now. And what's the consequence of that going to be? So each generation exercises power over its successor and, and each insofar as it modifies the environment bequeathed to it and rebels against tradition, resists and limits the power of its predecessors. So insofar as we, so we don't only influence the future, we also can affect the past their influence on us. Our contemporaries, to go back to the question that was asked earlier, we live in a sorry state where our Christian forebears are being assaulted politically. They're racists. They're colonialists. They're whatever. They were monsters, according to contemporary academia. Like the people that lived in bygone generations, you would have thought they were all Nazis. I just saw, the, again, this lady, this old, little old lady in Hamilton walking along with a cane being berated by Antifa for being a Nazi. Her brother fought the Nazis. 
And she was being called a Nazi because she was going to a political, uh, uh, People's Party of Canada political rally. No sense, th th there's an assault on uh, the old by the young in the name of the environment. So the point of all of these illustrations is the question of human nature. What is human nature? What's its moral nature? And once we've identified what that is, how do we preserve it? And how do we strengthen it? And how do we diminish it? And there are two ways of doing it. And the one is to hollow it out and create men without chests. That's one that he's already made. But there's another way of doing it. And the other way is by using scientific means to augment it. And this is what we call transhumanism. So you take human nature and you seek to perfect it or enhance it through various means, chemical, biological, um, artificial limbs, whatever. So I can make myself bigger, faster, stronger, living longer. Uh, there is a, I'll give you an illustration of this right now. Human 2.0 is coming faster than you think. Will you evolve with the times? Our technology, our machines, is part of our humanity. Author, computer scientist, and inventor Ray Kurzweil from Google once said, we created them to extend ourselves, and that is what is unique about human beings. In the past few years, there's been considerable discussion around the idea that we are slowly, we are slowly merging with our technology. Many of you have laptops in front of you. Many of you can't pull yourselves away from your laptops, from the little ro glowing rectangles in your pockets. I've had to turn mine off. I know it's there at all times because there's a psychological effect of it. It, it, it. it pulls you. You use it, but how is it also forming you? You're given free software. There's no such thing as a free lunch. You're, you're being data mined, right? You're, and somebody's making money off you using that technology, it's also psychoaddictive. And it also has a damaging effect on mental health, demonstrably so now. Guess who doesn't use, allow their children to use these devices? People in Silicon Valley. They don't let their kids use smartphones or tablets when they're young because they realize that the plasticity, the neuroplasticity of the brain is such that they will become addictive and they will be imp impotent. Uh, morally, personally, they'll lose motivation, whatever, they will become addicted to it. And they can't help it. It's not because they're uh, morally defective. It's because the, the technology is powerfully addictive and they literally become impotent. And so uh, one study, I, I was a pastor in Toronto and I had to speak on the issue of pornography. One of the effects of internet pornography is it's so addictive that uh, in the way that it's presented that, that people can't stop watching it and they find themselves literally impotent at the age of your age. It happens. And not just men, it's also women. It's, the, it's, it's a... It's a, it's a crisis that never existed in my generation, back when there was just porno mags or whatever. But this is now, it's in your pocket and you can access at all times and you can't get the image out of your mind and the effect of it is you watch ever more violent and degrading stuff that's also demonstrated. And I'm also aware that the instance of child pornography is skyrocketing off the charts. Young children, not just being exploited but being abused. Okay, so I've got power through technology, so do you. That's the good side. What's the bad side? You're watching your screen. What are you watching? Who's on the other side? Do you think of this person as a person or do you think of this as something that's entertaining you? Do you ever give a moral consideration? You don't because it doesn't seem like there is a person there. It's just an image. Okay, these are all just illustrations, but Kurzweil says that we are merging with our technology. We are becoming transhuman. We are becoming like gods. Godlike powers, and it is a godlike power. If you think about the Lord of the Rings, there were seven Palantir seeing stones that you could gaze into and see somebody in a, in a distant place. Uh, Tolkien was being very inventive. 
Nowadays, we have palantirs in our pockets. I can see that. Now, those could also see the future, so it's not quite the same. But, um, but still, you could see somebody on the other side of the planet. Talk to them. Have a conversation with grandma who's in Australia. Extraordinary. Kurzweil promotes this. He thinks it's a good thing. He's not the only one. It's big business. The commodification of human nature and the fusion of human nature with technology. For him, it's, it's as I say, he used to be involved in Google. Silicon Valley in general is all in on this. It's, it's social media. It's also in the pharmaceutical industry. So the, the, the uh, drugs that are used to change somebody's sexual um, nature, so if you're male, to make you more female, the, the uh, hormones and so forth, who profits from that? Big Pharma. It's being promoted to encourage the, the, uh, the, identi the identity of the child, but the identity of the child is at odds the profession of gender is at odds with their sex. Is it helping the child or is it harming the child? What would be the standard of help or harm? The child, I guess, m presumably, let's say, let's give, let's be uh, generous. The child wants this to happen. Does the child know moral consequences? Does the child really know what this will be like? Does the doctor really know what's happening to the child? I happen to think they have no idea. Would the doctor do this to himself? Not very often. Who profits from it? So this is Lewis's point. In the abolition of man, the power over nature, the power over human nature, doesn't actually give us power over nature. It's the power of some people over other people. And what is lost in the process is any sense of humanity. It gets defined and redefined, and ultimately the whole thing gets lost. And this is an indirect assault on God, I will submit to you. So I said many years ago when I came to faith in the, in the mid-90s, uh, my first observation that modern heresies are not theological in nature, they're anthropological. They're assaults on human beings as a way of getting at God. They can't get at God because that's impossible. The cross has put that uh, beyond the reach of the devil. He lost at Calvary. It's a fatal blow. It cannot be recovered. He is lost and there can be no winning, but he can still go after human beings, those that bear the image of God. And that's what's happening. That's how Lewis portrays it in his fiction at any rate, as a diabolical assault on human nature to make people miserable. Can't undo what happened at Calvary. That can't happen, but he can pervert people, turn them away, make them miserable, make them think that Christ's victory at Calvary was not a real victory, that there, it's a desperate situation from which we cannot be extricated. We have no power. These guys say, we do have power. Here's the means of power. Technology. Humanity 2.1. But this is transhumanism. There are others there. So you say there's an AI World Congress in London in October. Don't go there. But it's there. I will tell you that it, it's not only at this Congress in London, you will find it, it at Oxford University. It's at the Singularity University in California. It's at, at all of the major institution universities around the world. It's at the University of Toronto. It's in UBC. It's in Oxford. It's in Cambridge. It's pretty much every major research university are doing what I would call transhumanism. or. They are doing something that I'm going to describe as post-humanism. So let me give you a distinction here. Transhumanism regards there as to be something that we call human and to simply make it better. So there's something that's genuinely human and, and it's distinct and we're going to make it better. Ray Kurzweil thinks that. So we're going to take, you know, I'll put a patch on my arm that will allow me superpower or allow me extended life or whatever. So we can augment what's already there. Maybe we can extend what is distinctively human and upload it to a computer somewhere so that I can live eternally that way. Or maybe I can inject the blood of young people into my blood to give me a longer life as well, which I won't name his name, but there is a man in Silicon Valley that's also doing that, not just one. 
blood transfusion from young people, the idea is that the, 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 the blood in young people has a vitality that is missing in older people as you get older, and so that will help enhance your life. It's, a, it's an experiment. Why not try it out? Fountain of youth, using science as a means of augmenting the human condition. You can also do it through therapeutic means. So, and many people would, would favor the, these sorts of things. So if there's a cancer or there is a disease and you use a gene splicing to try and avoid that sort of thing. These are ethical conundra in our day, but they're, but they're there. And research is being done on it and experience, experiments are being done on it. But Savalescu, Julian Savalescu at Oxford University, who is the uh, head of the Uhuru Center for Practical Ethics, um, is a leading opponent, uh, proponent of human enhancement, transhumanism. Oh, I said posthumanism. Transhumanism regards there to be a human nature and they want to make it better. Posthumanism says there is no such thing as human nature. A human being has the privileged position historically in the Tao of being superior to the animals, superior to the planet, right? It's, there's a morally privileged uh, status there. We bear the image of God or something, or there's something about us that which is superior to the animals. Uh, Post-humanists say it ain't so. We are no better than the animals, morally, ethically, in any sense, and furthermore, we're also not morally superior to machines. And I can tell you that post-humanism, uh, under the guise of eco-criticism, is not only alive and well, but it is a dominant mode of study in universities right now. So the environmental movement, the positive side, is taking care, being good stewards of the world that God has given us. I regard that as a Christian mandate. But conceived in a different way, if you don't think that there's a certain uh, status of human nature within the created order, the environmental movement can regard human beings as, as merely creatures that create carbon footprints, and it's the objective of those who are advancing humanity to diminish those carbon footprints. What is that, what is that a euphemism for? Killing them. That's how you reduce carbon feet. It's a terrible e euphemism. I know people uh, who call themselves Christians who aren't going to have children because they don't want the carbon footprints of their progeny to blight the planet. Exercising power over the next generation. I find it baffling. I mean, I think their motives are, are the, the intent is good. The thinking is perverse. It's also desperate. It's, it's, it's a despair. If you believe that human uh, inventiveness, that God gave us minds to change the world, which modern technology has, then you would also think if there is an environmental problem, technology can also be part of the solution. But this is just despair. We're, I'm not going to have children. Enforced sterilization. People being encouraged to do that. You have a comment or question? Uh, just a comment. I remember seeing ads very in the recent past where it was like an advertisement for how to reduce your carbon footprint. It was like a little online quiz or something that you could do where you could admit stuff that you're in daily practices and whatnot. Like and it would tell you things that you, would, that, you might, that you are doing that you could be doing that would reduce these carbon footprints that you have. And the number one thing at the very end of that They think that's a good argument yeah, that, that, you know, right. because they think that carbon's a poison. Yeah, so CO2, the stuff that comes out when you breathe, is a poison. Yeah. The thing that feeds the plants. They think that's a poison Basically. because their scientific education was brilliant. Yeah. The CO2 that feeds the plants that produce the oxygen which we breathe, so 
the carbon, for, by the way, so the effect, if there is a growth in carbon dioxide, which there is, it results in a, a greening of the earth. And that actually is what's happening. There's a greater greening of the earth. So if there is an increase in CO2, you're feeding the plants, you're giving them greater, and that means that there's more food for the animals, which means that there's more food for people, which means that all of the carbon footprints are doing is providing food for the actual people, which you're committed to not having, which is going to kill off the plants. So it's, it's just a form of nihilism and despair, it's, and it's terrible science. Yes. But this is post-humanism. It's regarding the, the environment, namely the green stuff, to be morally equivalent to a human being. That's, that's the one thing that I find is very hard to get across people who don't believe in God. Because to them... They do believe in God. They believe that they're God. Any, anyone who explains to them about, you know, there is such thing as a, an, a, an earth designed to maintain itself even with humanity in it. So I think you have to begin with the moral argument that C.S. Lewis does. Do you have a sense of justice and injustice? Do you think it's an injustice to pollute the environment? Oh, yes, I do. Where did you get that idea from? So to go, go to that and say, where did you get this idea of injustice from? Is it like, do you, have you observed injustice? You know, you've observed an instance. I mean, I mean, the concept of injustice. I mean, you sense this so strongly that you will absolutely fight and die for the injustice. Where did you get this idea from? Because it's not a physical thing. They, they, they no, I understand. It's, it's taking, uh, that's correct, you're going beyond the bonds of, bounds of human nature. You're denying the first commandment, which is to be fruitful and multiply. That's the first commandment, actually, as in chronologically the first. And I, I don't, I'm not saying that we have, we're Before the fall. Burn, burn the trees and, and of course not. But Lewis's point is exactly that, that the abolition of man is, is the power of man, some men over other men, first point. Second point, it gets rid of man altogether. So in the name of saving humanity, you're exterminating humanity. Does this make sense to you? It does. Okay, let's go back. Let's take a few steps back then. So he's, he's simply pointing out the consequences of getting rid of the human being as an ethical category, as something that has sanctity. If you get rid of that, this is Lewis's observation he makes elsewhere. Whenever we try to elevate the environment in its ethical importance, we regard it as something we ought to protect. Above human nature, we don't actually elevate the environment, we demean human nature. We, we, we denigrate it, and that's all that happens. So he says it's diabolical. Believe it or not, the trees are not going to thank you. And neither is the grass, and neither are the animals, because the animals that are domesticated need you to take care of them. If you leave your cat outside, your cat goes feral, and the cat doesn't do very well. It's a domesticated animal. You could think, I'm going to let the, you know, liberate the cats. The cats would not be very happy. The cats are domesticated. They, they live in the presence of human beings. Same with dogs. It's a process and they, there's a humanization and they, they are there and they, they are enriched by our presence as much as we are by their presence. So it's a very, very strange view of human nature, but effectively it's the post-humanist view. It's that human nature has nothing distinct about it. It has as much right to its rights being protected as does the laptop in front of you. 
because it exists as well. So existence itself now is given human rights. Now this is happening all over the place. It's, that's called post-humanism. That's the most, uh, I think, the most dangerous of all. And that's growing. Now that, that is, a, that is a, a death cult, a suicide wish, which disguises itself as doing a good thing. But it is effectively a culture of death. It's already happened in the, uh, so I'll give another illustration which I often use uh, to illustrate my point about the power over human nature. In the uh, definition of abortion, the legalization of abortion, that's defining when life begins, right? That's one of the issues there. In euthanasia, it's defining when life ends. If you define something at its beginning and its end, you're defining everything in between. Right? You're saying, okay, that's not human. It's not human there. At what point does it begin as human and what point does it stop being human? Because there's a certain age at which you stop growing and, you're, and you stop maturing and then you start degenerating. You're, some of us are approaching that age. I'm on the, I'm on the downward slope myself. Right? I'm degenerating in that sense. So given the fact that I reached my peak physically, whatever, at a certain age, Am I thereby, thereby losing my humanity? If not, why not? My, my opponents would probably say yes, so let's kill them now. But, <laughs> but that's the, the point is wh where is the definition and how can I re re uh, refute the charge that it's just an arbitrary thing? Because it seems to me totally arbitrary and who's going to make the decision? It seems to me it's the people who are going to benefit from it. But it, that's not going to be me. Do I not have human rights? Do the people that are having abortion and euthanasia and act on, do they not have human rights? Even if they agree to the process, do they not have human rights? So by the way, if somebody violates you criminally and you don't press charges, the police can still, and the state can still press charges because they are gonna defend the rights of somebody who's been violated. You don't even have to agree to it. The state will st step in because they'll say that person has been assaulted. And and she's not being pressing charges because she's been too victimized, she's too afraid, but we're going to stand up for her and we're going to, we're going to press charges against the, the abuser. This is a good thing. So it's not a mere instance of uh, the choice there, it's the principle. The human being has been assaulted and it's for all those who stand on the side of justice to defend that. But as I say, human nature is being defined there at its beginning and its end and everything in between now then. So you're finding increasingly that, that elective surgeries are not just elective, they have to have it. So again, the, the, the sex change operations, which they say, this is my identity, I choose this identity, or the language of um, the, identi the identity imposed up upon them at birth that language as if it were an act of will that made them determine that's a boy, that's a girl. Somebody imposed that upon them, but now that they have a choice, they're choosing to be other than that, as if the original were a violation of their human rights and now they're exercising them. How do we know that that person who says that is right? They think that they're, they think they're right. I don't, I'm not denying that, they, otherwise they wouldn't be saying it, but how do we know that that person's right or wrong? There should be some way of, de of determining it, not just that they want to do that. I want to kill everybody in this room. What's wrong with that? Is there something wrong with that? What is it? You should be able to, we should be able to enunciate the principle. Well, these people are human beings. They bear the image of God. You may not do that. You may not take another's life. It's not your own to take. You can't even take your own life because it's not yours to take. God gave you the life. It's his, it's his authority alone that gives and takes life. He decides when your life begins. He decides when it end, ends. You can't even take your own life. You don't have the authority to do it. That's what, that would have been the historic position. Nowadays, it's up for negotiation. And that's what Lewis is talking about in the abolition of man. This is happening and it's increasingly the conditioners who are a certain social elite who are making the decisions and they're doing it and this is the irony and it's a great and bitter irony it's being done in the nature in the name of humanity right
I almost pulled it all down. The real picture is that of one dominant age. Let's suppose the 100th century AD, which resists all previous ages mostly successfully and dominates all subsequent ages most irresistibly, and thus is the real master of the human species. But then within this master generation, itself an infinitesimal minority of the species, the power will be exercised by a minority smaller still. Man's conquest of nature, if the dreams of some scientific planners are realized, means the rule of a few hundreds of men over billions upon billions of men. Who are these people that will make these decisions? They're the intelligentsia, the wealthy, the privileged, the powerful, who are inciting the reduction of the human species for the sake of the preservation of the planet, which is actually for the preservation of their interest as they see it. I think it's the doctrine of demons. It's so diabolical in its uh, logic, and it's so easy to refute that only demons could persuade people that such a stupid course of conduct was good, only. It's, it's a great delusion. It's a mass delusion. Because he says, there neither is nor can be any simple increase of power on man's side. Every new power won by man is a power over man as well. So each power we get is a power over our own nature, so we lose every time we win. Something is lost and when something is gained. Every power we gain over our own nature means a loss of some power in our nature. So, most people in our day have technological means that are so extraordinary that uh, your, your grandparents are astonished at what you can do on the internet. They're absolutely astounded. But I'll tell you, the moral character of your grandparents is far superior to yours, almost always, because they didn't have those powers that allow you to get around moral character. Because you can do it by means of power, but do you have the ethical uh, fiber, the moral fiber to use it wisely. Like Spider-Man, with great power comes great responsibility. Have you ever had the great responsibility cultivated? Because you have to have it cultivated. So you got superpowers, okay. Have you got a super ethics to deal with the superpowers? Have you considered the consequence of having this power? It seems like what Lewis is describing here and what you've some of you have described as the, this despair. The power has not led people to feel exuberance. It's, let, it's made them feel defeated, beaten down, desperate. Uh, the uh, psychologists uh, have uh, observed in studies that uh, your generation is absolutely paralyzed by anxiety. And they say it's because of technology, social media in, in particular. Snapchat, those sorts of things, the particularly so, some social media more than others, because you, you compare yourself to other people. There's this visual image. You imagine this person living a life, and you can't live up to that. And there's a, sort of a, a moral despair that creeps in. And you don't actually ever meet with people other than through a device. So you don't actually have experience, and, and those experiences lead to a sort of a moral fiber being developed. Do you ever actually meet with other people? If you don't, you should, but you should choose your company wisely. Bad company corrupts good character, after all. But each new power won by man is a power over man as well. Each advance leaves him weaker as well as stronger. In every victory, besides being the general who triumphs, he's also the prisoner who follows the triumphal car. So, as tra the transhumanists advance in their powers and ad advance and extend human life, are people morally superior in the process? You would think from our political overlords that they were, because they talk about us being the most tolerant, the most inclusive, the most loving, the most generous, the whatever that there ever was. By implication, those of a previous generation were less loving, less tolerant, more hateful, whatever. So it's, it's a combination of this extreme pride about ourselves with an extreme 
contempt for the future in the name of the environment and at the same time a hatred of the past. I describe people like that as psychopaths and sociopaths and narcissists. They look in the, the reflection in the water and boys say, that's boy, is that ever a good looking guy? I could look at you again. You, keep, you know the story of Narcissus? He looks at himself as a beautiful young youth and eventually falls in the water and drowns. Now note, he, he's very careful. Lewis is great with this. I'm not yet considering whether the total result of such ambivalent victories is a good thing or a bad. I'm only making clear what man's conquest of nature really means, and especially that final stage in the conquest, which perhaps is not far off. Because remember, he's, this is Nazi Germany time, eugenics movement, and it's looking pretty awful. Eugenics was condemned as a war crime after the Second World War, by the way by all the Western powers. They never gave it up. They never gave it up. So gene therapy, that's eugenics. Selective breeding, that's eugenics. In vitro fertilization, that's eugenics. Choosing the sex of your child, sex selective abortion, that's eugenics. Choosing for eye color and intelligence, those are all eugenics. What is the implicit prejudice that underlies it, I know what the ideal human being is and anything that is not that I regard as subhuman. Well now the category of those who uh, we can give the wonderful uh, predicate of being human is pretty darn small. And it has no moral standing at all, it's all surface. But, but, but Savalescu is aware of this. And he says that uh, we need to use genetic science and improved pharmaceuticals and moral education to improve the human race. So he's aware of the moral problem here. So we need, we need to use psychoaddictive pharmaceuticals to improve people, to make them more courageous or to make them less nervous. Now, how many people here have taken psychopharmacological pills? They're widely prescribed. Are you anxious? Here's a pill. Are you depressed? Here's a pill. Those are there to help you be a better human being. Do they actually help you? Yes and no. They make me addicted to the thing and I don't like the side effects and it's like, yeah, this was good and that not so good and okay. And I'm not making a judgment on the, the thing in general. I'm just saying that th these are already being operative. And these are experiments, by the way. You're being given experimental pharmaceuticals. There's also moral education, which he thinks will need to happen through conditioning. So it will be in, in tolerance training in schools. The, the, sex ed, the sex ed, that's moral training. It's conditioning you to, to approve of things that you may not even agree to, but you have to be approving of it or at least accepting of it. That's moral training. You ignore the actual physical consequences of early sex, different types of sex. You ignore that. It's all sex. It's your choice. They introduce it at the age of six. And uh, what do they talk about? What they introduce, what's the first concept? Consent. Consent. Children at the age of six are taught to consent. Now, do you know what consent means legally? You know what the age of consent is? Yeah, that the, yeah, that's the age. It's called 16, age of consent. That's at the time that the law considers you morally capable of judging whether the action is something that you want to do. Anything that happens before that, you're considered to not have morally developed sufficiently to make that judgment but they're teaching six-year-olds the concept of consent. Now that's a legal concept, by the way. So you tell me what's going on there. When you teach a child a concept that the child cannot possibly morally grasp, and yet you say you're teaching them consent, it's teaching them to be willing to do things that they can't possibly have the moral uh, awareness of to utilize. It's, it's grooming, that's what it is. I wrote that in the National Post several years ago. I was censured for that.
surprise, surprise. Yeah, many are choosing to homeschool. They're not going to leave the homeschoolers alone. I can tell you right now. It's it's a temporary measure that it, it's they don't leave um, they don't leave you alone in Hobbiton. The Shire is not going to be left alone. Sauron is going to seek you out in the Shire. I am serious because it's a it's a it's a, 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 a desire to dominate all life. It's a lust for power. It's a will to power over the human. There's a perversity to it. It's not just, here's what I can do what I want to do. It's no, you're going to agree to what I agree. So it has a religious dimension to it. And it does have this uh, aspect of the abolition of man to it. And by man there, he's not talking about the mere physical nature, although he, that, he's also talking about the moral imago dei that scripture speaks of. Yes? One of the craziest things that I've heard recently, uh, a buddy of mine had a girlfriend, had a friend who was part of the LGBT. Yep. And they provide housing for certain of those individuals. Okay. Um, okay. Like it's designated? Designated for if you feel like you want to be just part of your... Is it cheaper? Okay. Um, it sounds like a good deal. <laughs> so why do I just have to declare it? I get like chief. Okay. The, uh, what was astounding was she was approached by one of the, I guess you could call it, council members of the LGBTQ community, or yeah. one of the big people that advocates for them and does all the organizing, and went up to them and says, uh, and started talking about why she likes what she likes. Yeah. Oh. Because that otherwise you're discriminating against us. And I thought to myself. Yeah, you have to be pansexual. You That's have right. You have to be pansexual. You have to like drag queens. You have to like transsexual. By every part of that LGBTQ community, you have to like them and everything that they do and be attracted to them because otherwise you're being a bigot and, and discriminating. Correct. And so that the charge of discrimination is merely a. a, a a tool to get rid of every moral objection. And really, it's getting rid of the, the moral component, which, as we've acknowledged, everybody intuitively knows about. I just thought it was incredible. The reason it happens, though, is people are agreeing to it. If people said, that's, I'm not going to tolerate that. That's ridiculous. That's it would stop. Yeah. Well, this doesn't surprise, what you're saying doesn't surprise me one little bit because I've noticed that uh, pedophilia is on the rise and the justification for it is that they're, they're born that way, they're born attracted to small children. Why not? Where, where's the objection? You, you have to have a standard of normative human sexuality though, that's the point. Like, you have to have that in order to make that argument, and they dispute that there is a normative human nature. So there's no nature to nature. That's the point. Nature, does human nature have a nature? In its philosophical sense, they say no. Well, if that's true, then anything goes. And it, it will have to go, because otherwise you're, you're contradicting what you said when you were saying you were inclusive and... Right? You're, you're a hypocrite. You have to agree to that. You probably have to participate in it as well. And that's actually what happens in uh, that hideous strength. He's, at the point at which he rebels against this, he's a sociology professor, he's asked to stamp upon a crucifix. And he's not a religious man, but he thinks that there's something wrong with this, and he, he, he won't do it. He just won't do it. And at that point, he, they turn on him, and he it's sort of like a, a, a spell is broken almost when he says, no, I'm not going to go along with that. It's called science fiction. Science fiction always is a contemporary uh, social commentary uh, in its 
historical origins. Mary Shelley's Frankenstein is a social commentary on what's going on in the sciences. C.S. Lewis's science fiction is a commentary on what's going on in his society. It's presented as a future scenario, an unrealistic one. Everybody knows that it's entirely realistic and it's talking about what's going on in contemporary world, but it's presented as if it were unimaginable when everyone realizes it isn't. So I think science fiction is some of the most profound uh, explorations of contemporary stuff. So I watch it and find it really interesting. But ultimately, everything gets deconstructed to uh, mere physical causality. So our preferences has a, uh, you know, I was born this way. It comes down to that. Well, that is suggesting there's no rational categories that no reason can determine these things. It just, it is what it is. This is who I am. You have to accept it. That's an appeal to justice, by the way. When they say, you have to accept it, I say, well, what, you, are, you may be what you are, but I don't have to accept it because you're making a moral argument, but you said that moral arguments were invalid. Why do I have to accept it? Why ought I to accept it? You're saying that there is a moral objectivity, but you just said there was no moral objectivity. And it ends up, well, but that's what I want to do. Okay, but that doesn't mean that I have to agree to it. But if you don't agree to it, then you're a bigot. And I'm saying, but if I do to agree to it, then I'm being bullied. Which do I prefer? I think I can cope with being called a bigot myself. I don't particularly like it because it's not true. But um, So he is observing this about uh, modern science. And really, it's an attack on scientism then. It's not just an attack on the. Uh, what's going on in the humanities, it's what the sciences are doing, pursuing scientific progress for the sake of progress, but they never define the progress, and what is called progress could also be considered a regress. If you go back to the argument he just made, every advance in power over human nature is also a loss. What's the loss? A loss of moral control. Is it any wonder that people are psychologically traumatized, if that's the case? And if the people who are there to take care of them, their parents, their teachers, their government, are the people that are victimizing them, who do they turn to? It's, it's, it's a sorry state. But I don't think there's anyone other than parents who can do that, and adults who can do that. We're the ones that actually understand moral consequences, or, or ought to. So again, in your churches and in your companies and in the government, the, the most important thing that's being taught now is ethics. Like all the company, we need people to do ethical training because they just seem, they don't seem to get it. You can't do these things and we need them to be trained because they don't seem to have an innate knowledge of the Tao, which previous generations would have. And I can tell you because I'm old enough now, I know people that own companies, sometimes quite wealthy companies that tell me they can't find young people that they want to employ. And it's not because you don't have native abilities. It's because they don't have the moral character that they would have expected of them. Which is not indicting, indictment of anyone here in particular, but that's, they're observing the effect of the education system and it real, it, they're unfit to employ. Because believe it or not, your philosophy degree is not going to get you a job, or your English degree. That's that, that particular knowledge is not really the value. The value is the character that comes from being an ethical human being. If, that, if you have that with your philosophy degree or with your English degree, then you're employable. Because you have a mind that is able to make arguments, write well, be persuasive, be points, you understand that. But you have with it the moral character to be willing to do new things and to be teachable and willing to work in a team, right? That's what employers are looking for and not, I don't want to do that and I'm ready to go home right now. What? You want me to work till five o'clock? How dare you? But, uh, but I, you know, but I want to go to the, to a game. Like there's a, I, I really want to do this and I, I want the weekend off. You know, I want to work 
four days a week, not five, because I don't want to live to work. I want to work to live. Other way around. Right? And employers are like, but I have to make a profit. You know, I need you to work a little bit more. Not willing to do that. Okay. Anyway, so that is more or less the gist of the uh, abolition of man. Um, and I, I really think that it, it's, it's the key lecture, and it's the one that is most influential. And I, I encourage you, if you haven't read it, to spend some time looking at it. But he says, and this is a key point, the conditioners choose what kind of artificial tau they will, for their own good reasons, produce in the human race. So they're inventing a new moral law and a new moral human nature. So there's a moral human nature and there's also a physical human nature. In other words, they're recreating human beings according to what pattern they themselves don't even know. Who will benefit from it? The people that they're creating? That's the Frankenstein scenario. Did Frankenstein thank his maker? His maker hated him. What have I done? Motivation was never love. Anyway, he's observing this, and the reason he observes it, and the reason that I've come to talk to you about this, is because I think that by being aware of it, we can actually address it and stop it. People without, that are only interested in power lack moral fiber themselves. They've been, they've been accustomed to privilege and power and the lack of accountability. If there's a moral response to it, a cry out for justice, and above all, uh, the power of prayer, I think that powers and strongholds can be brought down. I do believe that with all my heart. So anyway, I leave you with that, and thank you. <laughs>